channel. Hi everybody, how are you doing today? I hope you're having a wonderful weekend. And I, I really am hoping that you enjoyed my lasagna uh, making last night. And um, it, it isn't the best lasagna in the world, but it is wonderful and tasty. Um, it, it was um, fun to make. It was fun to make. And um, the, the parts that are originally mine are the vegetable slices. The other recipe that I found online only had the mushrooms in between with the bechamel sauce. But um, my my other um, my other original touch is the nutmeg in the white bechamel sauce, and of course the the recipe didn't call for vanilla almond, but it does taste wonderful, and I think I'm gonna keep um, using that because I can make a whole variety of different types of foods with. Um, almond milk and um, tofu. So it, it is a very wonderful tasting food and combination. So it is allowed on the starch solution. Uh, you know, it's unsweetened. I know it's, um, there are so many different flavors out there. It's hard to pick plain, you know what I mean? But um, I'm, I'm so glad that I chose the almond milk because it's a perfect substitute for dairy. So um, anyway, guys, uh, I think what I will be doing today is nothing much. I'm just going to be doing a little research on the next part of the Madeline McCann timeline review. And I, I have to say, it, it's very unnerving um, to see all these discrepancies. I, I should add that mainly it wasn't the McCanns who appeared to be um, fibbing or fabricating. It was all the other witnesses around them that appeared to be right off, you know, um, nothing to do with reality or truth or completely contradicting each other and one another. So I, I don't know what's going on. Um, excuse my wet hair, it's, you know, it's still drying and um, I, I have to do something about this hair, but uh, for now, that, that's exactly the way I'm gonna wear it. <laughs> I might put it up later, I don't know. But um, anyway, um, I, I am continuing with the Madeline McCann case later on today. And so uh, all of my subscribers and uh, all of you faithful people, whether you subscribe to my channel or not, thank you so much for coming back uh, regularly and thank you for being patient. Tomorrow I will begin to respond back to your channels. Um, I, I've given myself enough time, I think. Uh, I don't know if I will be as, you know, uh, abundant with the comments as I was last week. I, I think I'm going to have to slow down if I want to start focusing more on my channel. But I love all your channels, and I have been playing them over and over. Uh, all of your channels. Um I've, I've had, you know, I go from one browser to another. I, I don't know which one to watch first, but um, they are playing indeed all day and pretty much all night too. <laughs> I, I've been up until 5, 6 a.m. every morning watching them. And so um, just because I, I want to make sure that I don't miss something really essential. Uh, I don't watch all of your channels every day, but there are certain favorites that I have, and I think you'll know who you are. And uh, of course, the arts and painting is one of my biggest favorites. Uh, my other channel is based on art and, and painting of the Renaissance and uh, medieval periods and even, you know, the classical periods. And I, I should get going. 
a little bit on something with that. Um, I have a video all ready to upload. It's been ready for two years and I haven't bothered. But, um, you know, I, I just, I love all your channels, like the um, meditation music and the copyright uh, free music for backgrounds and videos, your cooking channels, your sewing channels, your arts and crafts channels, um, your walking tours, uh, your trips. My goodness, um, you're exploring your pets and your animals and your gardening tips. Um, my goodness, I, I have to allot one day for every, you know, every genre. And um, your daily vlogs are the most fun and interesting. And I manage to keep all of my subscribers interested and, and informed because to just simply watch a little fun every day to me is, is nice and necessary, but not enough for me. You know what I mean? I, I don't, um, my bathroom fixtures that I need. Now I have other things there right now that have to go and possibly I will get rid of them as well. I'm not sure what I'm going to be doing with them. My closet space can can do with something like that in the closet. I can, you know, um, push things around. But let me show you my, my two bathrooms that I'm talking about. And um, you'll see the vases with these um, art, uh, artificial and dry flowers that I, I purchased last fall for my bathrooms. And let me take you there right now, and I'll show you what I intend to get. So hold on. So guys, this is the powder room, and um, I've been trying to fix it up as nicely as I can. Some of it's Dollarama things, and some of it is HomeSense. And this is what I got at HomeSense last fall. And my mom's paintings, she didn't make these paintings. The ones that she made were all stolen, but these go perfectly with the wallpaper. And this is the wallpaper right here. It's a peachy coral mauve color. Um, let me see if I can, I don't know if you can see that any better. And so I thought that vase blended beautifully with the yellowish orange in the wallpaper. And so I just love those flowers. And um, I need a stand. This has to go. And as you can see, I need one with preferably drawers so I can tuck things away into them. This is just an old plant stand that I decided to shove into this corner for now. But um, it has to go. It's not sturdy. And I need to move it or get rid of it, something like that. I don't know which. <laughs> so um, that is what I'm talking about for the powder room. Now hold on while I go to the master bathroom. So um, I, I need something for this corner here, something smaller than this that I have right now. And it's going to hold that up. This is another purchase that I made last fall, and the vase as well. And so um, I want to get rid of this altogether or maybe put it in the closet where I could certainly use some more space um, for things that I, I've been tucking away. But um, yes, the, I need it for this corner right here. And I never use this bathroom because it's hard to clean. It's hard to maintain. And my mother was immaculate, but um, it, this was her bathroom and my dad's bathroom. So um, basically I, I'm needing something for that corner right there. And um, I, I, I've done everything that I could with the towels and everything, you know, everything is matched. And this is the other part. That painting has to go into storage. 
Um, it was my dad's favorite, but it's not my favorite, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, my mother's painting that was hanging there was stolen. So those are the projects that I have on hand. I have a lot to keep me busy here, and I've been letting everything go since last spring. Not even last spring, because last spring, I didn't do all those windows. I didn't do the drapes. I skipped it all. I just got so busy and um, I wanted to say a few things about the Julia Wendell um, situation and how in a way actually it does bring some focus and light onto the Mac Maddie McCann case which is very still very high profile, even though a lot of you do not remember or know much about it, because it is quite an old case. It's going on past 15 years old, and so it's almost two decades old. Um, if Maddie were alive, uh, she would be turning 20 this coming month, and so what I'm saying is that if it weren't for Julia Wendell, certain truths um, would still uh, not have come into light. And uh, what I mean by that, it, it, a couple of things. Um, and before I get into that, I just want to say how, you know, it is discouraging. It, it's, it's not um, descriptive enough to say that it's simply disappointing. All the situations around the Julia, Wendell, and Maddie McCann cases, um, they're not disappointing, they're not only discouraging, but they're unpleasant to think about because of the lack of progress either one situation or the other has. Um, Julia seems to be uh, stuck in the situation where she's attempting to find out who she really is. And I don't know if there is anything to the story that she may be a missing child. She very well could be. I'm, I'm in no position to say yes or no. Um, I certainly don't doubt her memories or her lack of memory. Um, one way or another, something is very wrong and off there. Uh, as for Maddie McCann, that's where I get really discouraged. Um, okay, so we have Julia Wendell. This is what, where I have been stuck. We have Julia Wendell, who's becoming of age. She's now an adult, and she has spent the better part of her childhood um, you know, in the situations that she's been describing, either neglected or abused or whatever have you, going through trauma, going through bitter disappointment, going through um, shock and anger with her mom, things like this, her alleged mother. I, I call her her mom, but I don't know if she's really the biological mother. Um... I, I don't understand why the mom would be refusing the DNA test to take a DNA test, and so do the McCanns. When uh, it, it, it's so simple, you know, it, unless there's something else there that is being hidden. Now it could be that one of the McCanns, I don't know, are carrying some sort of we would sell, and they don't want anybody to know. I'm just, you know, trying to improvise here by giving you a hypothetical case. Or maybe Julia Wendell's mom may have robbed the bank when she was 15, and her DNA is on a criminal rec record case. I don't think it's the truth. But you know what I'm saying? Those are the extreme cases that's why I get discouraged when I think of these things. And I, for those of you who don't remember or are familiar with the Maddie McCann case, uh, when it first broke and the year after 
the whole story broke. And two and three years after, um, the news went crazy, uh, publishing details that were never true or never fact, never heard or uttered. They were too good at that. Publishing facts that were not facts, but fabrication. That's one thing. And then the nannies that started coming out of the woodwork. This nanny, that nanny. That nanny was was at the crash. This nanny didn't arrive until a certain point, but they all were witnesses. One nanny contradicted another. One employee of the Ocean Club uh, complex contradicted everybody. It, you know, guys, that's what I'm saying. Um, there's something so unreal about the whole thing. And yet, it's not the McCanns. It's not the McCanns themselves. You know what I'm saying? At least not from my perspective. Uh, the only thing that Kate really actually said that doesn't fit um, would be that the uh, she signed, she didn't sign Maddie out that day that she allegedly went missing, but Jerry did. But the logs don't show that. So um, it could be that the nanny brought the children in and she just stood there um, waiting for Kate to show up at 5.30, and that's when she signed them out. I don't know. I don't know what what the story is with that. Very often, they're not that accurate or concise, but you have to remember, too, that there were no children in the crash that afternoon, or at least uh, Ella had been signed out very early, and so Maddie was the only one there, supposedly. Um, I'm beginning to question that quite a bit. So what I'm saying, guys, is I'm I'm so I'm so discouraged about this case. Um, nothing makes sense. It's just like the story of Cheryl Hansen. She wanted to go and and visit her cousins, and then. She, her mother wouldn't let her go, and then all of a sudden she let her go. And then, oh, but I better run after her because I think she got hit by a car. It doesn't make any freaking sense. I, I think personally that Cheryl Hansen never made it for that walk. She was gone before. She was gone before, guys. I, I That's what I think. I, I don't think she's a cold case in that respect. I think she passed away maybe that day or the day before, and something was wrong there. It could have been an accident. It could have been, I don't know. I don't know what it was. But if they had to hide her body, if that's the case and they had to hide her body, uh, I don't even want to go there. I don't want to get into that. It, it's so disheartening and discouraging. And so what I wanted to say about the Julia Wendell situation is that here she is, knowing that there's a good chance she may not be the child of this alleged mother. I don't really think they look that much alike, do they? I, I think it's more of a family resemblance type of thing. But I don't know. I don't have the facts. I can't tell for sure, you know, who is related to whom. So um, she's now old enough to go seeking, and she's actively seeking and searching, which is what Maddie should have done if she was still alive, guys. So that's that's why I'm almost at the point of being heartbroken, because I know deep down... You know, and I don't want to discourage the siblings, you know, Maddie's siblings or Maddie's parents or whatever is going on. I, I don't want to, you know, sound, oh, I think, you know, that 
Maddie is not here anymore and I know the truth. And I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that everything points to the fact that Madeline is gone. She's not on this life anymore. She's not on this planet, you know, virtually in, in physical form anymore. I, I think she's a spirit up there. Um, I think she's gone, guys. She's gone. We don't hear anything from Maddie at all. Um, I don't think she's around. And Julia Wendell's situation made it so crystal clear because here she is fighting for her identity and her the power to not to claim someone's identity, but to find out who she really is. I think she should, you know, if deep down she really thinks that she isn't who, what her birth certificate might say or claim, if she's really thinking that, yes, by all means, I would keep searching. I mean, if her birth certificate says something that doesn't match hospital records or anything else. Yeah, there might be, there's probably something there that's not right. But what I'm saying is Maddie would be doing the same thing, would she not? Unless she's found, you know, two parents that look exactly like she does, um, or Jerry and, and Kate and she knows absolutely nothing about this case. She'd have to be really isolated. She'd have to be like literally locked up in a cell not to know what's going on. She, she can't be around anymore, guys. She can't be. Um, I, I personally don't think that she was there that week. And I'm going to be going on with the next set of... Um, statements and uh, events that took place before that in the timeline. So, um, you know, I'm just saying that if it weren't for Julia Wendell, it wouldn't be as clear as it is now to me that Madeline is not alive. But I can't say that as 100% sure, of course. But everything is pointing in the direction that Maddie is gone. And she was a bright, happy, energetic child. And I don't know if she were alive how happy she would be, but she would certainly have retained that sense of intellectuality, right? That thriving, um, outgoing type of you know, curiosity. Certainly she would have questions about her own identity, would she not? And I I don't think that she's alive, guys. Um, I have, up until this point, thought that there would be a good chance that she, she'd be alive. And, you know, I don't think that anymore because of Julia Wendell's case. Julia Wendell, who is assuming to be Maddie, is the person <laughs> that convinced me Maddie is not here. She's not here, guys. Um, all of this commotion could not be going on if she were indeed alive. So that's what I'm saying. And so... Um, I, I would say to Julia, you know, thank you for bringing that right into focus. Because if it weren't for you, we would be waiting to hear back from Maddie. Maybe this is good in a way so that Maddie can come forward and say, no, you are not Maddie. I am Maddie. You know what I'm saying? But... In a way, it reminds me of all the going back and forth with the maid, the nanny, the 
Krishnani's and the hotel staff and the police. He said, she said, all those false things floating around. You know, the one person that's going to get hurt by this when he gets out of jail is Christian Bruckner. Um, because I do think he might be able to shed some light on other um, child molesters and, and abductors. He might be. He might not be. But, I mean, I, it's apparent to me that the police didn't go in that far enough because because he was in jail, they let it go. But I, I think I would have pressured him, maybe, I don't know, if they did or not, into telling them more about that underground world of child molesters and child abductors. He might have been able to shed some more light on that. And mind you, I don't know if he ever laid eyes on Maddie, but I, I can feel that um, he's going to be very badly damaged by this when he gets out of jail because everybody is so intent on blaming him. Well, what if she's gone and he had nothing to do with it? You better be sure of what you accuse him of. Um, I know that you probably could tell us a few things that he hasn't told the police. I, you know, I wish people would be more on the up and up. And I, I don't understand all this hullabaloo about being ambiguous when answering police questions. Of course, you know, everybody has rights. But when giving statements to the police, why why tell fibs? Why make things up? Why fabricate BS and crap that never took place? We're investigating the disappearance or possible murder of a child, for goodness sakes. Why not be more on the up and up and stop, you know, treating it as though it was a big circus joke? A little girl's death is not a joke. I don't care what the circumstances are. And I think people should have been more serious and more sincere. They weren't. That's another thing that gets me really down about this. All this mystery and all this crap. All the people who danced around the police and, and evaded questions. And, well, I would have to commend the McCanns because they were going to be indicted for murder. I, I think they did the right choice to abstain. Um, they made the right choice for them at that time. But I'm, I'm talking about the newspapers and the nannies, bullshit. I don't understand it. They weren't there. Or at least they didn't see what they claimed to have seen. They couldn't have seen it. And knowing what Maddie truly looked like, they couldn't have said all those things, implying that the child they were talking about was indeed Maddie. They couldn't have, guys. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty upset about that because... That wasn't so much in focus as it is now that I've gone through the documentary. And so, well, I'm going to go and do some more research, and then I'll be getting back to you. Hi, everybody. So um, I wanted to apologize for what I'm, I've been saying about uh, the Cheryl Hansen case. And, I, you know, I have to remember that her family is still around and she has siblings um, who survived her. I, I don't know where Cheryl is. And it, it isn't as though I want to accuse the family of hiding anything. I don't have any information. It's just that I guess I'm demonstrating what it's like when people are faced with half-truths. Um, we're more inclined to disbelieve everything else if we can't have the whole picture. Now, I think that's as 
best as I can explain it, because I just proved to myself that unless I have all the facts, I'm going to dispute everything that came before it. And I'm going to challenge the stories that people are pushing forth. I, I have to reject them unless I have the entire truth, the entire story. Um, and this goes double for the Maddie McCann case. I, I can't believe any of it. I can't believe that she vanished without a trace. I can't, and I don't. Um, that part is so Mr. Fang, and I cannot believe that all of those sightings of Maddie after the alleged abduction were false, were wrong, were mistakes. I can't believe it either. So if anybody out there has any, you know, uh, ideas or words of um, enlightenment, throw them my way, please, in the comment section below, because uh, I am so tired of being in the dark about this. And um, another little bit about Julia Wendell and the Fia Johansson situation. Um, I wanted to call your attention the two, and I've forgotten this myself. Back in 2008, um, the year after Maddie McCann disappeared, allegedly. And um, if you can recall, a total of four psychics um, went to uh, investigate the Madeline McCann disappearance. They went to Portugal and they offered the insight to the McCanns and to the media. Those four psychics were um, Carla Barron, John Oliver, Michael Snyder, and Fia. And so what Carla and John said was that um, Maddie uh, would not remember anything at all. Uh, she would be living in Germany, and um, but she would not remember the McCanns and the details surrounding her disappearance would be horrific. So she would be living in Germany. And I think this is what has a lot of us, you know, hoping against hope. And then now we've all heard about Maddie Hannibal, who absolutely bears no relation to Maddie McCann. She just resembles her. And um, so, um, and then Fia said that Maddie McCann and her had a deep connection, a deep energetic connection, and um, that uh, Maddie will be found in Germany as a very talented singer and that she will return to her family. And, I, you know, do we see a pattern emerging here? Uh, now, this was years ago in 2008. We're now in 2023. So I, I really don't know what to believe. Um, I, I certainly don't count on it as being factual, um, but I can count on it being a gimmicky kind of luring of the public. I don't know what, it, it almost seems as though we're just sitting waiting for something else to transpire between um, Julia and Fia or about the Maddie McCann case. I don't know. Uh, indeed, Julia is a singer, and um, but she wasn't living in Germany, and she doesn't remember anything. So it's so weird, guys. Um, I, I, I've had it. I've had it with this gimmicky kind of headline-ish, kind of trap. It, it, it's, it's just not real anymore to me. And I don't know what to do to make it all go away because no matter what we do or what we say or think, it keeps coming back to haunt us. 
And I, I would say we should just give it our all, you know, go all out and, and look for Maddie McCann's remains. There have to be there has to be some sort of sign that she has been on this earth. She can't have just vanished. Dead or alive, she has to have left something behind. And I, I just don't understand all this confusion. You know, all, all the headlines, all the patterns and the stories and, and the psychics and oh it's just not real to me. Everybody. So I'm back with another little bit of um, our Myron McCann case. And um, as I have been trying to explain, the reason why I launched this um, review of Missing Kids is because uh, it, it's a series. And I basically the Myron McCann review is a series in itself of my Missing Kids series, and I'm going to be taking turns um, reviewing new cases of missing kids. When I say new, I don't mean recent, I mean different. Um, new to my channel, but different from what we've been discussing previously. And uh, I'll be taking breaks and going back to the Madeline McCann case um, as Richard D. Hall uh, explains it because it's such an extensive and complex case with um, many missing pieces to the puzzle. And so um, this will be the third part of my continued um, episodes on the Madeline McCann timeline. And so what I've been explaining is that we have gone from 10 p.m. May the 3rd, 2007, and we're moving backwards, just as Richard D. Hall is. And I have his video. Uh, it's a four-hour documentary. Um, it's linked in my playlist, Missing Kids Found or Lost. And so if you want to catch it on your own, you can go and have a look at it. And I... Uh, I, you know, I, I don't really subscribe to um, any of those channels because they're not exactly what um, I normally look at, but his channel is worth checking out. It's very interesting, especially the content on Madeline McCann because it's different. It takes a fresh approach. And there are some others linked there as well. Um, I ran across one terrifying video the other day, not done too long ago either, alleging that the McCanns had Madeline euthanized like an animal. And I, you know, I had to entertain it, but I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, there's just no way I'm going to entertain that here on my channel. But... Theories like that are out there, and I'm sure it's because people want to know the truth. And when they don't know the truth, they're going to come out with outlandish, maybe real, maybe not real, theories as to what happened to this little girl, who would now be 20 years old. So, um, today we are going to focus on the missing six hours uh, of May the 3rd, between 2 and 6 p.m. Um, when I say that, I, what I mean is the absence, uh, the very apparent absence of the McCanns from uh, anything tangible or any witnesses on May the 3rd. They were missing between 2 and 6 p.m. And we are also going to focus again on the alleged high tea scenario. And guys, what I'm finding is so, 
it's just more or less of the same bizarre contradiction. So let's um, begin. And uh, maybe I can make some sense out of this. I don't think so, but let's start. Um, so we left off with the fallacious um, witness statement of one of the hotel workers who claimed to have seen Madeline McCann in the tapas area at 445, which of course didn't jive with anybody else's um, account of what happened, whether it be true or false, or the logs, the nursery school logs. So, um, well, guys, the fallacious sightings, the wrong sightings, the false sightings, the mistaken sightings, um, the fabricated sightings, it didn't stop that. They didn't stop there, guys. Um, ladies and gentlemen, they continued all throughout the day. Um, the false Maddie sightings were nonstop that day. Um, the cook saw Maddie at the Tapas restaurant at 4.30 p.m. And that is just too off to correlate with Cat Baker's observation that Maddie and Jerry had high tea with the twins at 5.30. Um, there's a missing hour there. And no, uh, either the watches were not synchronized or something. So let's push on. Um, that statement, that observation made an absolute liar out of the crush nanny, Cap Baker, who also made two other conflicting statements. Um, uh, Cat Baker said um, Jerry was having high tea with Maddie at 5.30. And um, she also said that Kate signed Maddie out at 5.30. Well, that could be true. That could be highly possible because if it was in the habit, if it was a habit or if it was customary, um, maybe prearranged, with certain children that they were to be bought to a certain spot at a certain time, um, that would be possible. And then the parents would then sign them out wherever they were. I don't know, I don't know, because nothing correlates, nothing makes sense here. So um, now uh, that would have to do with how the logs were customarily signed and maintained. If um, both statements are true, then uh, they were not, these logs were not always signed in the room of the crash, obviously. So let's move on. Guys, this witness that I'm talking about right now that I'm going to introduce you to is a fantastic piece of work. Charlotte Pennington worked in the baby club crush where the twins were, I would assume, and she claims to have seen Maddie first on Sunday, May the 29th, no time affixed to that, and then on the morning of May 3rd in the mini club area um, because the areas overlapped, but the way that I understand it, they didn't at least not, not the baby club. The baby club was right by the tapas restaurant and not the mini club. So I don't know where she got that. Maybe it was outside. I'm not gonna bother. Okay, so uh, she saw Maddie on the morning of May the 3rd between 9 and 10.30 a.m. That's a big, big gap. I, I don't understand it. But she didn't really, I guess she didn't know what time it was. So, Charlotte never mentions, ever, when talking to the police, she never mentions the high tea scenario that Kat Baker did. Or that Kate did. She did, never mentioned it. Okay. So... May goes by, June goes by, August goes by. Okay, hold on, we're coming to that. And so, um, although she did emphasize that she never saw 
anything strange regarding Mary or the disappearance or anything, you know, the whole thing. Never anything out of place. Nothing out of the ordinary happened. Now, let's get to late September 2007. Um, Charlotte Pennington is quoted in a Daily Mail article. That night on May the 3rd, Kate screamed, Maddie is abducted, Maddie was abducted, they took her. Indeed, um, you know, there's one other thing about uh, Charlotte Pennington. She really resembles Fia Johansson. She, maybe in the slightest degree, you guys can be the judge of that. When I flash their images by at the end of this video, um, it's kind of incredible to me what makeup can do, but I just thought I would introduce you to them both side by side. And so um, Pennington, Charlotte Pennington, absolutely dismissed the significance um, that the police found of both the McCann's absence for six hours um, at the Ocean Club Villa from two to six p from two to eight p.m. Um, so I made a mistake before. From two to eight p.m., not two to six p.m. So, um, which is just before Madeline's alleged disappearance. Now. Here is what I found each and every time I keyed in the name Charlotte Pennington into the search box. Every single time. Charlotte Daly, sports reporter for Mail Online. Why? I don't know. I'll link it below. You can have a look at everything that's been said in the article. And, um... It's so strange that it, she, her name would come up as a journalist. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. How about actress, model? Question on me? I'm not sure. Okay, let's go on. Um, although this nanny never mentions a high T to police to validate Kate, Kat Baker's statement, she brings it up in late September, all at once, all on her own, packed and filled to the brim with details of how so many children and adults were present that they had to make it last until 6 p.m. Obviously, each witness um, cancels out each other. Cat and Charlotte. They are not reliable, as many others. They are not reliable. Um, where certain little bits of truth may be there, other details fudge them out. So I, I don't know what, what was going on that night. I really don't know. Um, so uh, neither was a credible witness, neither Nanny. And regardless of what was going on, it does appear that the ma, ma, the um, it, it does appear that the McCanns themselves could not. Well, it's not their fault because they were on their own. I guess I don't know. Um, the McCanns could not validate their whereabouts, their alibis, and so really we can't be sure exactly where they were or what they were doing with whom for how long, until at least 8 p.m. that night, for sure, for sure. And so, um, obviously, the article where Charlotte Pennington talks about Haiti is fallacy, it's a fairy tale, it's pure bunk. We wanna know what happened to Madeline McCann. We don't wanna know about your journalistic skills especially in a case like this, it's out of place. So um, neither Kate nor Kat ever mentioned any such detail 
in their account of this high tea. It was just the McCanns and the kids. That's it. Nobody else was there. And so um, Baker only mentions the McCanns and no one else. So she's a little more credible, but still not quite there. Naturally, the most obvious person to um, question and refer to would be Jerry McCann because he was the one who was there, guys, or admits that he was there. And Kate, in her own book, written seven years later, um, claims that she was, a, a, you know, she was not there. She was on a run. She was on a beach jog. And so um, the police turned to Jerry on May the 4th, who never mentions a high tea. It could have been the way that it was, you know, conducted. Maybe the questions didn't lead to 5.30 p.m. or what you were doing. He never mentioned it. And so um, on May the 10th, um, Jerry claims that he and Kate both returned from where I don't know to the Ocean Club and he booked a tennis court between 2.30 and 3.30 p.m. So um, even the police releasing details and statements, there's no mention of where the McCanns claimed to be until then. Or, or, you know, when exactly they returned, who saw them, nobody saw them. And uh, apparently, according to Jerry, they played tennis until 4.30. But guys, if you remember, we went over this before. Um, in Kate's book, uh, which is, her objective is to tell the truth. Um, she admittedly says she wasn't there until 5.30. And she places herself um, running on the beach at 5.15. Now, there's somebody who had a watch on. So I'm sure that she probably is the closest to what we're going to get as truth. I, I have to question even that sometimes because nothing in this case surprises me. So, um, Jerry, we're continuing with Jerry. Jerry also said that they, um, he and Kate, when he says they, he's, he's meaning he and Kate and not he and someone else or he and the instructor who happened to be there as well. But they never questioned the instructor. Hmm. See what I mean? Where's the instructor's statement? That would be so valid. So Jerry said they talked at the courts, the tennis courts, until 4.45 p.m. when the twins arrived in the tapas area. And that is when Jerry went to the twins. So if you can see this scenario, Nanny brings in the kid and the kid gets signed off. Well, Jerry didn't do it that day. And so... Um, he also claimed that he waited around and Madeline arrived at 5 p.m. bought by Catriona Baker, the crush nanny. And so um, before Kate arrived, um, the children ate a meal and they and Kate arrived at 5.30 and they, they uh, all departed at 5.30 p.m. And so it almost seems as though Charlotte later tried to invalidate Jerry and Kate's similar but conflicting alibis. And needless to say, the logs do say 525 for the twins and 530 for Maddie, uh, signed each time by Kate and not Jerry. And guys, I know it's an odd scenario. So we have to kind of think around it. It's not as though any of them would want to explain it to us. No, no. So um, I think it might be fair to assume that the children were bought there uh, 
from the looks of it, from the looks of it, between 30 to 45 minutes at least before Kate actually arrived and signed them out. Now, why did that happen? I don't understand it. Um, I really don't understand it. I don't understand it. it. It seems to be a gap right there. That's a big puzzle right there. Something there was going on and it's not clarified what it is. So um, why would Kate sign them out at 5.30? What, I don't understand that. Why didn't Jerry do it? Well, um, was uh, Jerry so sweet on the crush nannies that he forgot to sign them out? <laughs> uh, that is what it seems like, or that is what we are being led to believe, that he spent time with the crush nannies waiting for Kate to show up. I don't know. Because if he indeed did that, he would have at least signed them out, right? Unless Maddie, of course, wasn't there. Then he couldn't have signed her out. And because he couldn't sign her out, he wouldn't sign the twins out. Whatever it is, it's not logic to me. Um, so, Kat said, Catriona Baker said that Jerry played tennis and wasn't there. When, when she means he wasn't there, he wasn't at the tapas area. Wow. How the heck would she know that? See guys, okay, either it's a lie or they were doing something other than what they said they were doing. What I want to know is where were the kids? So um, what was really going on? Did Jerry have a tennis lesson with the instructor, with someone else? Uh, and was she watching the kids in the tapas area for him while he played and that's why he didn't sign them out? I don't understand that. Although, to me, it would make sense, maybe. Um, while they're still with the nanny, he didn't sign them out. And then Kate arrived. So, something like that. But not nice. That's not nice. Uh, when I say that, I mean, that's not... That's a mess. It's a mess of a day. And so, um, if Kate wasn't there... Um, who did he play tennis with? The instructor. Well, why don't we talk to the instructor? What was up with that? I, I don't understand it, guys. And yet it's so simple. Why don't you simply interview the instructor? It's so easy. You interviewed liars. Interview the instructor and see if there's another life. I don't know what's going on in this case, guys, but it's a mess. It's a freaking mess. And I'm so discouraged and upset. Um, okay. Honestly, I think the main objective here was to see who could outdo each other on contradictory statements. And so, um, you know, I, I have to stop here because I'm really, really riled up. I want to go on a rant. And I, I don't want to make it sound as though the McCanns are lying. But this is, this is a crap job of interviewing. Okay. Just because the police thought that Maddie might have been still alive at 5.30 or still there at 5.30, that doesn't mean they could skip over all these other witnesses. I, I think they did a crap job of interviewing. Really? Why? Because I don't see any other statements from anybody that made any sense. Maybe they just didn't release those statements. I don't know. But I can guarantee you nobody at that, at that vacation resort especially that week, 
Nobody, no child, no adult ever attended or mentioned a high tea, ever. This, what we're hearing, is fabrication. Now, I can understand that the twins were there with their parents having high tea. Maybe that's what they called it. Kids were eating before they went up to get ready for bed. Okay, but not all this, so it was a party that went way beyond, you know, the 5.30 time. No, that's all bunk. And I don't understand why a crush nanny or somebody who is calling herself a crush nanny, because I don't know what she was. She certainly wasn't honest. Why she would do this in a case investigating the disappearance of a little three-year-old girl. Why? Your guess is as good as mine. And so um, this is going to be a, a, hopefully a shorter video. Um, no cooking, no driving. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you very much for watching. And um, thank you for listening. And uh, thank you for being patient. And uh, please don't forget to like and subscribe. I will be back with you tomorrow with uh, another different case of a missing kid in my province. And uh, until then, sweet dreams.